Good morning and welcome to Southside Bible Church. Uh, grateful for any visitors we have and just hope you uh, feel loved and welcomed as we gather together to worship. This is now the time where we worship God through the declared words. So we continue in our worship as the Word of God is proclaimed. If you'll turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1, and there we're going to continue the study that we have been doing together as a church. We are currently in section chapter 1, verses 13 through 21, and it's all built off this therefore in 13, verse 13. And so we spent 12 weeks looking at the first 12 verses, and we were looking at the glory and the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ and, and Peter's now saying, you just can't walk away from those 12 verses, from those great realities, and say, I like the doctrine of election. That kind of clarifies everything up, and it connected a few things. I enjoyed hearing about a new birth and the hope that we have, and angels have epithumias with this longing desire to know and understand the gospel. That is too beautiful to not be taken up with it, to, to not just change your conduct, but to be completely reoriented in the whole way that you think, what you desire, and what you do. Uh, As the hymn writer said, it's a love so amazing, it demands my life, my soul, my all. And that's what we're studying now. Peter is saying this demands a major, massive response that will change everything about you. And that is what we find ourselves looking at this morning. So therefore, in light of or in response, this is the only way that you can think or live. And in this section now, there are three imperatives, three commands in light of the gospel. And those are what we've been hanging everything on. There's participles and phrases and indicatives and all these different things. But there are three imperatives that we're hanging our whole outline on. And we're trying to understand these three commands then in light of the gospel to us. And what do they mean? What do these commands mean? Well, we've looked at all three, and we have to understand how do they work together to bring about our sanctification, to grow us in conformity to Jesus Christ. So what do they mean? As well, how do all three work this way to our ultimate end? And so we have looked at the first two. In verse 13, we're to fix our hope completely on the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This cannot be part-time. This is the centrality of every believer. This is your hope. Your hope is not this earth and everything working out. Our main focus that everything else is pointing to and moving towards is Jesus Christ is going to come again and he's going to reveal grace to those who have longed and waited for his appearing. We are to fix our hope on that day. <clears throat> Secondly, we're called to be holy. We're to be holy in verses 14 through 16 because God is holy, and he says also as God is holy. So he's the standard, and he's the reason that we seek to be holy. I, I really could have used a, a month on that section, but I, I wanted you to digest it as a package in one setting. Be holy meant to be wholly given then to God, to give all that I am. Here it is, Lord, here's my life. It's consecrated to you. Holiness, we saw, was that God is infinite. He's off the scale. He's not even on it. He's above it. And we are not God, but we are called to reflect him. And so just thinking through that even more this week, you're to be holy in your forgiveness, You, the people of God, are to forgive like nobody else. You're off the scale in this world. The world has a little, small standard of forgiveness, and you should be completely different in how off the scale you are and how you forgive. You're to be off the scale of this world and its system of how you love. You love like no other because God first loved you. Are you holy in love? Like people look at you and just say, I can't figure your love out. Are you holy in speaking the truth into a world that is built on lies and deceit? You are off the chart in how you in love bring truth to bear to this world and this generation. Are you holy in compassion? Are you holy in conduct? 
within and without, are you holy in your hope? You hope so much beyond what this world hopes for. Are we holy? Are we separate from this world? I came across a, a quote, and I'll leave holiness behind. Not behind. We, we live and do it every day, but that section of Scripture. And there's a commentator. I want you just to hear this as we finish this point. Robert Layton said this. There is unquestionably among those who profess themselves the people of God. Everyone sitting here this morning should profess yourself to be the people of God. A select number, though, who are indeed his children. So amongst that group, he's saying there's a select number who are indeed his children. And they bear his image both in their hearts and in their lives. Few people who get this in their hearts and their lives. This impression of holiness is on their souls in their conversation. It has taken them up. They are holy gods. But with the most, a name and a form of godliness is all they have for religion. All they have is just a name and the external forms. That's all they have. We speak of holiness and we hear of it. And it may be we commend it, but we act it not, or if we do, it is but an acting out of it. It's not who I am, it's what I try to just put on the outside, a, a hypocrite. And so I, I pray that what we are learning and seeing, holiness is the person who is taken up with God, and the inner being is transformed, and now all of my inner is new, and it works its way to the outside Please don't die with external religion. Don't, don't die with the external formalities and not the internal realities. And so without holiness, he says, no one will see the Lord. And so I pray that, that we're seeing this is the only response to the gospel then is that we're holy in deed, conduct, and speech. Thirdly, the third imperative, and that's where we'll spend our time this morning, is that we're to live in fear. And I don't know about you, but with each imperative that we keep studying, it feels like we move further and further away from the ethos of our culture or, or the heartbeat of our society in modern day Christianity. We just, we're moving into fear now. We've looked at hope, and I think the church has lost its hope. Isn't that a shame? How does the church of God lose its hope? All of Christianity is that we hope, and now it's lost a desire for holiness, it's, I, I, that's just legalism. I, 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 I don't even want to talk about holiness. And now we're going to move this morning to fear. What, what is that? that? That's an Old Testament thing. Why is this guy preaching about fear when perfect love casts out all fear? As I said previously, our understanding of the Christian life has to have a place for all three of these commandments. It can't be that you just have a place for one of them. I, I like hope. I like the grace of God. Thank you very much. That's all I want to think about. These other two things I don't like. It's legalism to talk about holiness and fear. Are you calling the Holy Spirit and Peter a legalist? This is what they're calling the believers in Christ to do. You, you can't bring me back under the law. This is to fulfill the law. I pray that everyone in this room then will understand all three of Peter's imperatives and how they work together. That's what I've been praying for you, for me, that, that we can have, we, you can't have one without the other. This is a package. It's married. This is the response that the children of God have to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I pray that we understand this. And so I want to go to our Father in heaven and ask him to teach us to transform us with his truth this morning. We, we are fighting a lifetime of wrong thinking. There's false teaching that abounds in our country on this subject. And there is flesh that just can't understand how do all these things marry. There's natural thinking that gets in the way. And so if we need anything this morning is we need God to enlighten our minds and our hearts so that every soul understands how these three marry perfectly in the Christian life. And so let's go to our God and ask him to do what no human being can do. Father, we come before you with confidence because you are the one who is able. You are the one. These are the truths of who you are and how your children live in this new kingdom that has come in Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we are. We're, 
We, we battle natural thinking. We live in it, and it preaches at us and tries to conform us. And so I would just ask this morning, by your word, through your spirit, that you would renew minds. Lord, that we would all be able to see the gorgeous, beautiful balance of people who hope and people who are holy and people who fear you as they walk this earth. God, we need you to do this. We cannot do this in our own. And so I pray, God, meet us here this morning in a very special way. And it's in the name of Jesus that we do pray. Amen. All right, well, let's look then at the fear of God. Last week we started, <coughs> excuse me, by looking at the holiness of God so that we could understand the passage. And I really think in the same way this morning, we need to understand the fear of God and then we'll unpack these verses that are before us. So the fear of God is used some 200 times in the Bible. It's a major theme in Scripture. I just want you to hear some verses. Just take it in and listen to what God's Word reveals about this subject. I'm going to begin in Deuteronomy 4, verse 9. Only give heed to yourself and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things which your eyes have seen, the great deliverance that you've been through, Israel, unless they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Don't lose sight of a redeeming God and what He has done, but make them known to your sons and to your grandsons. Remember the day you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb, when the Lord said to me, Assemble the people to me, that I may let them hear my words, so that they may learn to fear me all the days of their life on this earth, and that they may teach their children. That is almost the same thing that Peter is calling us to uh, in chapter 1 here this morning. Listen to one of our favorite Psalms, Psalm 103, verse 11. The psalmist says, As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, has he removed our transgressions from us? Jesus, as a father, has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he himself knows our frame, and he's mindful that we are but dust. As for man, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. When the wind passed over it, it is no more, and its place acknowledges it no longer. But the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting to those who fear him. Him and, and His righteousness to children's children. And so there with the mercy, the forgiveness of God separating, in the middle of that, it's those who fear Him. Uh, Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The beginning to, to have wisdom and to live this Christian life, it begins with someone who has fear of God. The new covenant in Jeremiah 32, 38, they shall be my people and I will be their God. That's what we are sitting in that covenant this morning. And I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me always for their own good and for the good of their children after them. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good. And I will put the fear of me in their hearts so they won't turn away from me. I'll stick my fear right in their hearts in the new covenant so you'll never turn away from God. Everlasting covenant protection from him. Is that just Old Testament? This morning we'll see in Peter, no, Matthew 10, Jesus himself said, don't fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, <clears throat> but rather fear him who's able to destroy both soul and body in Gehenna and hell. And then listen to how the whole Bible closes out in Revelation 15, verse 2. John says, I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mixed with fire, and those who had come off victorious from the beast and from his image and from the number of his name standing on the sea of glass holding harps to God. And they sang the song of Moses, the bondservant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, O Lord God, the Almighty. Righteous and true are thy ways, thou King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou alone art holy. For all the nations will come and worship thee, for thy righteous acts 
have been revealed. All of your redemptive acts have been revealed. Holy is your name. Redemption, holiness, fear, everything that we have here in Peter. And so the great prince of preacher, Charles Spurgeon, said the fear of God is the soul of godliness. It's the very soul of godliness, the fear of God. And Peter this morning says it's, it's a response to God's great salvation. The fear of God is a response to his amazing grace and mercy toward us. So this is not an Old Testament thing. It finds its fullest fulfillment in a New Testament thing. It's a response. It's an attitude toward the revelation of Jesus Christ in his gospel. Those taken up with the new covenant, all that God is to us in Jesus Christ says, therefore, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay upon the earth. And so what is the fear of God? Because we know there's a fear that is wrong. There is a perfect love that casts out all fear for the believer of God. There is a wrong kind of fear that must be driven out of every believing heart this morning. Romans 8, 1, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I will never know a drop of God's condemnation as the child of God. I do not live in that fear. There is a fear that the whole New Testament is battling for, that it would be driven out of our hearts. In Hebrews 2, it says you were held in bondage all of your days because of the fear of death. And for the child of God, the fear of death has been removed in the one who conquered death that we saw earlier with Jesus resurrected from the dead. And so there's a fear of death and condemnation and all of these things for the child of God that must be driven out. The perfect love of God in Christ Jesus has to drive that fear out. Yet there's some part of judgment, even in this context, that God wants the fear to stay in your heart. And so it's not just some simple little ditty that answers it. Everybody just wants, okay, it's one little phrase. That's how I think about this. It's bigger than that. And you're going to have to work and labor this morning. We've got to understand this to give God the response that he desires from his children. And so I, I need you to work with me a little bit this morning. And don't think this is just some simple little answer. This fear is not one of condemnation. It's not judgment that throws you into a pit of hell. But it's fearing the one who can throw you there rather than men. It's get a little more fear for the God that you betray than the men that you seek approval. That kind of fear, <coughs> condemnation, is not the controlling attitude and emotion of the child of God, but there is one of fear that is right. And so I want to look at that. What is the right kind of fear that Peter, by the Holy Spirit, is commanding this morning? So I've gone over this several times, and it's been long enough. I'm going to do it again this morning. As I did a study on fear a while back, I kind of sense there, there are two kinds of fears revealed in the Bible, and I want to look at both of them. The first one is if you are an unbeliever. There, there, there is a tear or a dread that you should have this morning, and it's usually a fear over the harm that an object can bring to you. It's a fear that it's so controlling and overwhelming that you want to run away from the object. And so you spend all of your life fleeing from God. There, there's something about his holiness that we looked at last week, and all you want to do is get out of that. I don't want to think about that. I don't want to hear that. Let me get away. Let me hide. Let me cover. Let me run. Let me fall on my face. Let me die. It's the fear on one standing in the presence of the one that we looked at last week. The holy, infinite, off the charts, majestic and awesome God, that should bring a holy terror and fear into every unbeliever's heart. Get me out of here. Don't ever let me come into the presence of that one. To stand in the presence of the God we looked at last week without the gospel of Jesus Christ is terrifying. It's terrifying, the writer of Hebrews said, to fall into the hands of the living God. That, that's a terror that should shake any unbelieving heart here this morning. I got the worst news for you. Your kids, some of you, your parents love you so much and they've taught you this gospel since you were little kids. And it's terrifying for them to think of you, to say, oh, I, I want friends more than God. I want sex. I want popularity more than God. And these parents' hearts are broken because you're going to stand before this God with a handful of junk and so I want you to see this morning that 
If you haven't come to Jesus Christ in a saving way, it's a terrifying thing one day to stand in the presence of this God. So when you see this, you want to run from it. And unbelievers try on a regular basis to run from this God. We try to redefine Him. We try to get busy in our lives and our hobbies and the things we're chasing. And we will do everything we can to not deal with this God. And I just want to get away from Him. That, ooh, I can't hear you. That's all I can do. I don't want to deal with a God like this. The second kind of fear is what we're looking at this morning with Peter. It's a believer's kind of fear. And God is awesome. You want to hear this? That doesn't go away with salvation. God does, you don't get saved and God isn't still majestic and holy and awesome. I don't know where that comes from in the church. today. That doesn't go away. It's exalted and seen even more clearly for the child of God. I see it more than I ever saw it as an unbeliever. Has understanding God's grace taken away your view of how holy and blazingly glorious God is? Is there something that you've come to understand that God isn't that way any longer? The word says no, it increases it. But this gospel now can make you stand in the very presence of God, blameless, with great joy, accepted and loved. This gospel is amazing. You can now come into that presence and be a child and be safe and loved and adored. Just, this is unbelievable what this gospel can do. So I don't quit fearing the beauty and majesty of God. In fact, now I love it. And I just want to draw near it. I want to come near the object. Isaiah 6 saw it. And, and, and when he sees it, woe is me, my man of unclean lips. And then the, the tongs come and it pulls out the coals and it removes the iniquity from his lips. It's a picture of Jesus Christ, the atonement. And what does Isaiah say? God says, who are we going to send? Here I am, send me. I want, to, I want to draw near. I want to serve you. I don't want to run away from you. I want to be your man. I want to serve you. That's the kind of fear we're looking at when Peter saw the holiness of God. You know, when he's on that boat, it says he, he got up and he followed him. And so all he wanted to do was draw near to that object. That just, I want to go near. There's a beauty to it now, and I am drawn to it. So please get this. Perfect love casts out the fear of destruction and eternal judgment. But perfect love draws out our fear and reverence for God because of how he can love us this morning, it came at a price that should make us tremble, which is where we will journey this morning in the text, but just hear it and just out of the gate. So that's a big overview of the fear of God. If you've never heard that before, you're probably, your head's spinning. But it, 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 this is part of the new covenant. It's commanded of the child of God, and it has to be able to work together with someone who hopes fully in the grace of God. And someone who lives in fear. And so my hope is that this passage will teach us how to do both. And so let's start. If you'll look with me, I'm going to give you just a little overview of verses 17 through 21. Let me read it first. If you address as father <coughs> the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and your hope are in God." So let's begin in verses 17 through 21, one imperative. There's one command, conduct yourself in fear. And then we have it sandwiched in between these two thoughts. And so I'm going to call it slices of bread. This is a fear sandwich. So you got fear and you got these two pieces of bread kind of on both sides of it. And the first piece of bread is it says there's a father who judges impartially. And then on verse 18, it's knowing that you were redeemed with precious blood. And so you're like, wait a minute. Father, precious blood that redeemed me, how does that make a fear sandwich? That's what takes away my fear. I've spent all of my days praying and studying and meditating that God is my Father, and how do I live in light of the realities of that truth? How to not have slavish fear, but to live as a child. 
And so I've, I've fought for that truth since I was saved. And I have fought for the truth that I have been redeemed to take away my fear of standing before this God with all of my sin because it has been separated as far as the east is from the west. And so I have to preach that gospel to myself every day and now some scrawny old guy is standing up here saying, don't fear. The reasons and all the reasons that I've, that I've quit fearing, now you're telling me they're supposed to make me fear. And so there are landmines all over this passage and there are blessings all over this passage, and let's now journey slowly and carefully to see if we can understand them. So let's look at the first reason why we should not uh, fear wrongly, but fear rightly. This is a call to fear rightly. And in verse 17, it's a father who impartially judges. <clears throat> so if you really get the word father, uh, what happens? Loved, accepted, cared for, safe, Discipline, but not disowned confidence and trust. Such a beautiful reality. I had a friend in high school, and his dad was very influential, very influential, and all the best lawyers in town he had in his pocket. And this guy drove like a madman in high school. And every time we got pulled over, he would, they'd give his license and say, is this your father? And he'd go, yes. Oh, hey, slow down, son. And he would get off. And he knew there was very little consequences to his actions because of who his father was. How about if the judge of the supreme, not the supreme court, the supremest court anywhere, the highest one in the land, the highest court in the whole universe, you go no higher than this judge. And he just happens to be your dad. Your dad really loves you. Your dad has forgiven you of all your sin. Your daddy wants to give you everything that he's going to give his son, Jesus Christ, because you're a joint heir. We looked at that in verse 13 and 4 through 5. What might that do to you this morning? Exactly what it does to every carnal mind or believing mind that doesn't understand the truth that we are now looking at. Ha, huh, I can live any way I want then. This is great. Uh, arrogance. My dad is the judge. Let us just sin that grace might abound. More sin, more forgiveness. I love this. This is great. It's just as arrogant as my friend was in high school. God hates arrogance. I love in Romans 11 when the Gentiles start getting arrogant because the Jews have been cut off for a season. And he says, fear, you need to fear because if he cut off the natural branches for their unbelief, how much more the unnatural branches uh, live with a reverence and a respect. If this leads you to this prideful arrogance, you've missed the whole thing. God loves confidence in his mercy, but not arrogance. He loves that we live in certainty of grace. We have labored for that certainty for months. But Peter does something important here. He adds a little something to the judge who is my father to make sure we don't fall into this sin of wrong thinking. And he says, this judge who is your father impartially judges. God doesn't judge with two different standards. There's, <coughs> excuse me, I did a wedding outside with smoke and I just, this is going to be a battle this morning. It's worth battling, isn't it? God doesn't judge with two different standards. There's not one for unbelievers and one for children of God. He judges with the same righteousness for all. The same holy standard for all is himself. The only perfect judge, all of his verdicts are holy righteousness. You are going to get, you're not going to get some lightened up lesser standard because you're a child of God. Gulp. It isn't going to be a different standard. So don't get presumptuous that there's a standard in the courtroom that must never be uh, disrespected but reverenced for who God is. There's a, a, one of my favorite movies. There's this, uh, it was in the 70s in Virginia, and it's called Remember the Titans. If you haven't seen it, get a clear play and watch it. It's, it's unbelievable. And there's this coach named Coach Boone, and Coach Boone says to Coach Yost, and it's a, a black coach and a white coach, and they've got to come together now as they're integrating these schools to play football. And he's, he's telling the, the white coach, Yost, he says, you know, I may be a mean Gus, 
but I'm the same mean Gus to the white player and to the black player. I have no partiality. I do the exact same thing. And the players knew there's no impartiality. There's same treatment irregardless of race. And so we will get the same standard in judgment whether a child or not. Later in this letter, Paul's gonna, Peter's going to say, judgment is going to begin with the household of God. It, it isn't going to be this lightened lesser, like I'm not as holy to you, child of God. I want you to live in fear as you hope in the grace of God and as you seek to be holy, that your father who is a judge does not have a lesser standard for you. He is not less holy for you. Your judgment will not be my daddy is the judge, so nanner nanners but rather because who your daddy is, his character and perfect knowledge and justice live in reverence, fear of God. My father is not someone to be trifled with. Do you see this? C.S. Lewis put it so good when it was asked about Aslan, the the lion, is, is he safe? No, he's not safe, but he's good. He's good. Do you live your life in this way in fear and reverence Or has the grace of God been misunderstood in your life? That's the question that Peter's getting at and what we have to wrestle with. Has it brought a cockiness to where you think your father will judge you on some lesser or lighter standard? He's saying, wake up. How does this rock you to sleep that I'm gracious? Wake up. There's a holy God who is our father. Your life is to show a reverence for the one that you call Father, not a punk life, but a life I reverence who my dad is. And one last thought, this might, this is for free. It it could be to fear then, this fear he's calling us not to, is that our living then is not with hope in God. And the fear that our hope is in something uh, lesser, power, money, fame, whatever it would be, that you're sitting here, be afraid of making your hope something less than the coming to you grace of God. Be afraid of your heart that's put your, your hope in your children. Be, be afraid of, of where your heart might be leading and going. Be afraid of not living that your father's holy. That, be afraid of that. So first, one motivation, one piece of bread is you have a, a father who impartially judges and the second piece is unbelievable And verse 18 now is, I want you to to know what you've been redeemed with. And so look with me in verse 18, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers. The, The word knowing means to understand or to comprehend to come to the realization of. And so don't you understand, don't you comprehend? It's a, it's a present tense participle, and it means that you, you understand the redemption of what has come in Christ with continuing result. It, it's something that you don't get over. You, you get it, and you never get over it. It just continues to abide and can result in your life. You know how many times I've heard unbelievers and even believers say of a zealous new believer, what do they say? they will get over it. (laughs) You better not. You you better not get over the gospel of Jesus Christ. That better not get away from you, child of God, knowing this, knowing this. And so I just want to start with what Peter's point is, knowing what? Knowing what, Peter? What you were not redeemed with perishable things, but you were redeemed with precious blood. And I just want this word redeemed, it's such a beautiful word and concept. So there are several different nuances and the meaning of the word. I'm going to try to save you a long work through all of that. Uh, Romans 3.24, I spent a whole sermon on it if you want to pull it up. But at the end of the day, it means to buy back. And it's New Testament nuances meant to, to buy back someone from bondage for the payment of a price. Very common of slaves. Here's the ransom. I will pay it. I redeem you from your slavery. I bring you out to freedom into my family. And so Jesus Christ came into this world and he paid the ransom, the ransom price so that we could be brought out of slavery to sin and death so that we could belong to God, everything we've been studying in Peter. And so I just want to answer four questions regarding redemption right from our text here in Peter. First question, what were we redeemed from? 
What were you redeemed from? And Peter says, sin. In verse 14, your former epithumias, your former lust, your over desires. You lived longing for other things more than God. You had desires for something other than God. That's how you lived your life in slavery to sin, wanting something in this world bigger than God. He says it was yours in your ignorance. <coughs> it was, uh, what verse was that? Verse 14. They were yours in your ignorance. So you were ignorant. You were darkened in your understanding to God and his ways. Verses 18 through 19, you had a futile life, pointless, valueless, useless. You just went through this world trying to satisfy pleasure in yourself. And, and you're just, we're, we're, it was a futile life. There was no hope. There was nothing to it. The tradition of your forefathers, not divine truth. Uh, Ephesians 2, I think, sums it up well. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. And among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, these epithumias, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. So we were lost in sin, living for our lusts, and we, we couldn't get it. We couldn't figure it out. And we were children of wrath. The wrath of God was upon us. And there was no way to get it off. So we needed to be redeemed from that place and that state. Well, what were we redeemed with? Peter says you weren't redeemed with silver or gold. You, you were bought a slave or, or a valuable. When you did that, you paid them money. This is how you redeemed them or an article that you were buying out of the market. And yet your purchase price, your purchase price was higher. It was way bigger than gold or silver. If you would have had all the gold in Fort Knox, that is one one millionth of what you were redeemed with. Guys, you, you were redeemed with something so much bigger than silver or gold. Let that hit you. I want you to marvel. Just stop. If you heard this your whole life, ask God to speak to your heart this morning. You, you, were, you had the ransom price to redeem us from slavery to the devil, death, law, and sin. The ransom for sinners, Peter says, was precious blood. The, the, the ransom is precious blood being spilled and poured out for you. Which leads to the third question, who were we redeemed by? This blood is precious. Why is it precious? Uh, it was spilt... By who? The precious one. The, the, the reason this blood is precious, my blood is not precious, but to me. This blood was precious because of who spilt it. It was the Lord Jesus Christ. And listen to what Peter says in chapter 2, verse 4. Coming to this precious one, Jesus Christ, as to a living stone rejected by men, but choice and precious in the sight of God. Precious to the Father. You also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone. And he who believes in him shall not be disappointed. This precious value is for you who believe. It's for those who believe this Christ is precious. He's choice by God and he is precious. I tell you, it is from the one that this blood flowed that makes it so precious this morning. You were redeemed with the blood of Jesus Christ, the most precious blood that flowed as the ransom for sinners for our redemption, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, looking to that whole Passover, that Jesus would come and he would be the lamb without spot, wrinkle, uh, unblemished and spotless, the perfect son of God who would spill out his blood so that the wrath of God would pass over us. Hebrews 4.15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. The blood of Christ, the blood was precious. Please hear this. Because it was the blood of Christ. We were redeemed by the Son of God who was fully God and fully man. The one who hung on that cross was the God-man 
And he spilled out all of his blood on this guilty sod for us. Listen to Hebrews 9. When Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered into the holy place once and for all. Listen to this. Having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the precious blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So a blood with an efficacy for all of eternity. It does not wear out like gold or silver. It can make the foulest clean. Even you hear this. The blood of Jesus Christ 2,000 years later has just the same ability to save your soul and wash away your sin as it did 2,000 years ago. And it will have that efficacy forever. It's an eternal redemption. So you come here this morning, this blood still saves sinners who will repent and come to Jesus Christ and believe. This blood can wash the foulest. No matter what you're carrying this morning, it can wash your sins away and, and redeem you to bring you to God, to bring you as children safe, adopted, and loved to the Father. It is not just blood. It is the blood of Jesus Christ. It is the fullness of Christ in all of his person that has come and brought you redemption. Peter draws out the Holy One in this passage, if you'll look with me. And sorry, I'm running out of time, but it, it, this is all that was involved in the redemption. Look at verse 20. <clears throat> he was foreknown before the foundation of the world. This precious one was already set apart before the foundation of the world to be the lamb that would come and shed his blood for you. This wasn't just the world gone bad with Adam. This was planned before the foundation of the world. And Jesus said, I will be the Lamb of God. So he was foreknown by the Father to come and do this very thing. Remember it said that we were foreknown and in verse 2 and 3 of Peter, that God set his love and knew us before the foundation of the world. Well, he knew us and he knew the Redeemer uh, that he had had to save and redeem us before the foundation of the world. In verse 20, it says that um, he has appeared in these last times for the sake of you. So he took on a body that the eternal Son of God took on a body so that he could give God his ransom, precious blood. He needed a body to spill out his blood and to be the Lamb of God. So the, the eternal Son of God, the infinite one, takes on finite. He, 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 God says he prepared a human body for him so he could offer it up as a sacrifice for our sins so that his blood could be spilled, so that it could be precious to redeem us and bring us back to God. In verse 21, it says it raised, he, was, he was raised from the dead to show that his ransom, that his precious blood did indeed pay the price of the ransom so that we who are redeemed are brought back for God. So the resurrection declares that his blood was precious and it was satisfactory to God the Father to offer you this morning a free salvation, to offer you this blood for the saving of your souls. And it says that he gave him glory in verse 21. That's the ascension. So after he rose and appeared to 500 and the apostles and many more witnesses, he's taken up right before their eyes and he's brought up to glory. And the father exalted the precious one as head over all. The, the, the sovereign over all, over the church over all. He's now exalted at the right hand of God, the precious one crowned with glory and honor. Isn't he precious? Well, my fourth question is, what were we redeemed for? We were redeemed by his blood. We were redeemed by Jesus' blood. And what were we redeemed for? Look at verse 20. It says, for the sake of you. This, this, I know sometimes we get excited for the glory of God, and we should. But I think you go too far when you say the only reason he died was for the glory of God. It wasn't about you. You're missing something glorious. It's about both. And right here, it's telling you, he did this for you. He did this for you. And 2 Corinthians 8, 9, he who was rich, Jesus, 
became poor on this earth so that we who are poor, we have nothing to offer God, might become rich. We might get all the inheritance in Jesus Christ. And so it says, uh, verse 21, who through him you are believers in God so that your faith and your hope are in God. Everything is about God. You can hope with certainty. God did it all through this son that was foreknown, that died, was buried, and is raised in victory. His blood was precious. You can hope now with certainty because it's all in God. It's nothing in you. Look away from yourself and look at the precious one this morning, that that you will be holy and you'll fear as you look at this one. And so let me close this all up because you're probably saying, he's gotten really off this morning. Just come back next week. I do it every week. (laughs) Peter says, fear the one who impartially judges a father. And fear because you have been ransomed with a great price. Oh, so great. The precious blood of Jesus Christ. And he says, you can't look at this price and say, where do I get free sex? Where do I get the next drug? Where do I get the best possessions of this world. You, you can't look at this and make that your chief end. Let me look at this precious blood. Oh, the blood that flowed, how precious. And let me build my fortunes in this world. I want you to listen to Psalm 130. It captures everything we're looking at. The psalmist said, If thou, Lord, shouldst mark iniquities, if I marked your iniquities, O oh Lord, who could stand before the presence of such holiness? But there is forgiveness with thee. It's this word for atonement. There is forgiveness. How does God forgive you? By the precious blood of Jesus Christ being spilt out for you. That thou mayest be feared. And so what forgiveness of sins that thou mayest be feared? Exactly. When you see How God can forgive your sin this morning is he wouldn't look away from his own son when sin was put on him and he pierced him through and poured out the full wrath that we would have had to bear forever in hell. He took it all on that cross, spilled out his blood that he might be feared. This is a God who is not to be trifled with. Look at what he did for sin. So I cry to you this morning with all the fervency that I have. Don't you dare let the ransom, the precious blood of Jesus Christ, cause you to be okay with conduct unworthy of such praise. Don't you dare sit in this gospel and just say, it doesn't matter how I live. You defy this whole thing. Fear that. Fear trampling underfoot the blood of Jesus Christ. If we live as if this blood is not precious, we have reason to fear. And so we need a holy fear of a God who's a judge and a father that does not destroy a strong, full hope in the coming to you grace of God. And this fear, it strengthens it and refines it and stabilizes it. If you're not feeling that this morning, I want you to pray and meditate over this text until God awakens both experiences in your soul. You need a full hope in the grace of God and a full fear, and you will be transformed to live holy lives. You've got to find how this works. And if it doesn't make sense this morning, get in this text, memorize it, pray, get in the body of Christ, start talking about this until you understand it. Tim Keller said, you will be as holy as you are aware of what your sin cost Jesus. You will be as holy as you are aware of what your sin cost Jesus. And so we need to sit and meditate wave after wave of his love to ransom us from such a place. Let it hit the shore of your mind and heart like wave after wave again and again. What Jesus has done, his precious blood until it changes all of your being from the inside to the outside to live holy lives, holy given to God. And I'm going to close with this last illustration. I came across it this week, and it really helped sum it up for me, and I hope it will for you as well. I want you to picture a dad who has a daughter 
who's 17 years old, so mine's 16. I'm not trying to even bring her into this. 17 years old. She's been struggling lately, and she's kind of choosing maybe some wrong friends and making poor decisions. And she's kind of been cooling a little bit to spiritual things, and you just love her like crazy. And you just want to help her and set her free from her struggles. And then one day she's kidnapped by a gang of punks who are very violent. And they send you a ransom note and says, we will give her back for a million dollars. And they say, if you don't pay it, we will send her back in a body bag. And so the dad says, I'll pay it. Give me 24 hours to get it all. He has an equity line on his house. He takes that out. He sells all of his cars. He cashes out his retirement. He sells every possession, even his wedding ring. And he just comes up with it just enough, a million dollars for the ransom. And he comes and he meets the thugs and there's his beautiful daughter and he has all the money. And the daughter and the leader of the gang come walking up to him. And he hands the payment to the captor. And the daughter then walks back with the guy. She puts her arm around him. She turns back and gives her dad the finger and lays a big kiss on this guy. Be afraid of that. He paid everything for you. He gave the most precious one, his choice precious one, the cornerstone, Jesus Christ, who chose willfully to shed his blood for you. Are you going to scorn love like that? How do you look at this and hope in this world for money and your kid's success and all these other things? Fear not, hoping only in God and living holy, holy his who gave his son for us. Don't insult the blood of Jesus by acting like it's not infinite value. And so I pray that we would tremble this morning. Has the grace of God caused you to be cavalier towards sin? I'm, I'm asking that God would awaken us this morning if that's happened. Has, it, has, it, has the grace of God made you cavalier towards sin? Because this should awaken just the opposite within us. Let's go before God and ask him to do what only he can do. Father, we come before you and I feel a trembling in my own heart. God, that redemption came at such a precious price. And I just, how do we now go back to our captor and kiss him and hang out with that which was ours in our ignorance? And we lived when, with darkened minds and all these wrong epithumias. God, how do we go back to the, the devil himself and join hands with him? God, give us a holy reverence for you. Cause us to fear, living as if you don't impar judge impartially. Or living as if your blood, the blood of Jesus, is not precious. And so God, would you let the beauty of the precious one who was foreknown and spilled out his blood and was buried and raised and now has ascended in full victory, the Lord of the church. God, I pray that that would cause us to live in fear while we conduct ourselves upon our stay on this earth. God, that we wouldn't just act like you're small or less or that grace has made it think that we can just live any way we want and you don't care. God, I pray that that would be driven out that would drive out, your perfect love would drive that out of here this morning. I pray that um, we wouldn't get confused this morning, run back into a slavish fear. God, don't let us run into the wrong kind of fear. We have no condemnation. We hope completely in the grace that is coming. We, we run towards your coming. We don't run in fear of that we're going to be kicked out and condemned forever. God, we still hope in grace completely. And yet we see that we're to be holy, holy yours because you are holy. And I pray, God, that this blood is so precious that all we want to do is, is love and live for the one who shed it on our behalf. God, we marvel at how holy and beautiful you are. You're off the charts. And we worship a God who would send his own son on a mission to do this. God, take our lives and let them be consecrated, Lord to thee.
Awaken us. Lord, awaken us from becoming comfortable in sin and really not um, living into the fullness of this gospel. So be with us. Help us understand these three imperatives and let the fruit flow out of this church. For your glory alone, we pray this. Amen.